is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Deadwood, season one, episode eight. Suffer the Little Children, brought to you by Patrick. In this episode, the widow decides to stay in town, Trixie tries to kill herself, and I am left kind of wondering what the hell the deal was with the subplot with Veronica Mars. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So, yeah, y'all, yeah, I'm going to deal with the um, Kristen Bell storyline right out of the gate here. Um, I don't really understand what that was for. And I'm thinking it really has to do with Joni more than anything and our understanding of her. But I f- that's like the first storyline in this show so far that I've kind of felt like, at a loss. I I was really interested last episode when it's revealed that she and her brother are fucking con artists. I was here for it, you know? And then they get found out so quickly and things are taken, you know, in hand within the very episode that they're found out. I kind of expected that this would be handled in a similar way to Jack McCall, that like the episode would wrap with them having been caught and then we would find out what went on with them later on. But instead they, they are revealed and dealt with all within an episode before the dealing with them happens like two thirds of the way through. And I think it all has to do a lot more with Joni than it does with, with her and her brother. Uh, Flora and Miles, although I'm not sure that those are their real names. I would have to imagine they're not. Um, but I'm going to go through that storyline separately um, and to, to, and start things off talking about that. Because Flora picks up on the fact very early that Sai is on to her. And um, I really liked the fact that she's talking to Miles about it later. And he says something like, well, House, like you said that he was a a pretty sly person. How sly could he be? And she says, like, good enough that he didn't even break. And I could still tell that he was on to me. Um, so he's able to lie really convincingly and smoothly and well. The way that Sai figures her out is interesting. So how Flora decides to play it is she, you know, was in the gem when Doherty murdered the dude who was like looking at her the wrong way. And she flees back to the Bella Union and kind of like takes refuge with Joni. It's like, oh, I just saw this terrible thing and I'm awfully shook up and uh, can't I spend the night here? And it seems like she's already got Joni's number in understanding that Joni is A, gay, B, the matron of the establishment and kind of looking out for people, and C, nostalgic in a way when she looks at Flora that like impairs her judgment a little bit. And Flora decides to take full advantage of that and is like, well, what if I sleep here? And I guess the reason that she's doing this is because she wants to get a look at Joni's rooms because she's assuming Joni's going to be the one that has something worth stealing. I thought that she was going to go after the money from gambling and all of that, but I guess that's just under very good security. You know, they've got like bars up and stuff. So she's realizing that she's going to have to resort to like petty theft basically instead And that's fine with her. It doesn't seem like she has a problem with that. But when she gets up in the morning, and this is the kind of acting that I love, that it's so subtle that for a minute you're like, am I imagining this? 
until you see the other characters' reactions, and then you're like, okay, now this is definitely like on purpose. You know, she's this like unsure, shy girl until she wakes up in the morning and thinks that Joni is still asleep. And then she begins to get dressed with this very cold, determined expression on her face. And you see Joni watching her in this way that's sort of like, I did not see surprise on Joni's face. I saw her observing in a detached sort of way, um, but not looking like surprised or worried or upset or anything. In in short, there is no judgment of any kind in her expression. She's just watching her. And Flora is completely unaware that she's being watched. So she um she goes downstairs and she's like about to like leave for the day and she needs to find an excuse to go next door and see Miles. And uh, she finds that excuse by going into what equates to like the uh, the horror break room, um, and <laughs> tells one of the women there that she'll pay her two dollars for the apple and piece of cheese, which is damn good. And then tells Sai like, "Oh, I have to bring my brother his lunch," and Sai watches her, and he watches her not only like after like coming down the stairs and the way that she like talks directly to him and the way that she um, expresses what she saw that was so horrible. She watches the way, or he watches the way that Flora deals with this man who keeps stopping her and asking her to put her garters on. Um, And she is pretty, what's the word I want? She's dismissive enough of the guy with enough confidence that I feel like that is a little bit of a red flag to him. And then when she says, like, uh, it's time for me to go and give my brother his lunch, and she's heading right back over to the gem, the place that she ran upset from the night before. And that, to Sai, I think, more than anything, undermines her claim that she's so upset about this whole thing like oh really and then the very next morning you're gonna head back there and meet your brother for lunch like he's not coming here um so sai is suspicious Joni, it's so hard to tell because i don't Joni is not stupid but i don't know if it's that she isn't suspicious or that she knows perfectly well what this girl is doing and just doesn't really care enough to stop her. I feel like it's that one because she's just not stupid enough to be snowed in this way, I don't think. And later on, when Flora confronts her and is like, who do I remind you of that you're letting me like get away with this shit? She then like says, like, is it uh, a girlfriend, a, a little sister or is it you? And I feel like that's what it is, that Joni is looking at Flora and seeing herself, you know, years ago and remembering what it was like to be young, beautiful, a good actress and able to get what you wanted and be free. And Joni isn't free anymore. And so there's like a combo of like, of regret but also like wanting this girl to have a better chance at having freedom for longer than Joni herself had. And so letting her get away is her like contribution to kind of trying to like make up for the mistakes that she has made in her own life. That's my understanding. Um, And if that's what this is about, then I guess I see why the show included it, but I really wish it was a little bit more explicit than it, than it was. And maybe I'm just wanting to be like beaten over the head, but I'm not somebody who normally needs things spelled out for me that way. So I don't, I feel like if I am sort of like struggling with this a little bit, that I can't be the only one. Um, And there's a scene later on with Joni where Sai, like, obviously the deal is, Sai is in love with Joni, 
and Joni is obviously not in love with him. And when I say that he's in love with her, I mean it in that like unhealthy, unbalanced, abusive way that men express love. Um, not only in that era, but period, because men are not taught how to cope with emotions in safe and healthy ways a lot of the time. So what I get is that he wants to be her husband in a way like he's not gonna because obviously she's still a sex worker and he's not going to deal with that but he knows also that she's gay and that she does not see him that way necessarily and i'm not gonna say that he really cares about that so much i feel like if she were gay and he knew that but she wasn't a sex worker he'd be like oh well marry me anyway i don't care it's fine um, I think it's the combo of things that cir- that keep circumstances where they are. So what he's decided that he's going to do, if he can't have Joni be like property in that she's his wife, he's going to have her be property in that he has absolute control over her and does that by threatening her all the time. Um, and she, he offers in this scene with her after because <sighs> long story short, Flora breaks into Joni's room. She doesn't break in. She she lies to Joni and is like, oh, I uh, left a pin upstairs and I would like to go get it if you don't mind. And Joni seems to be quite aware of what's happening here, but then just says, yeah, go ahead and look for it in this sort of challenging way. Like, are you going to be this stupid about it? All right, then go on ahead and sends her upstairs. Flora is looking through her uh, her jewelry box, uh, intending to steal some stuff. And it's obvious that, like, first of all, Joni comes in and asks her, "How do you know what where the like real ones from the fakes?" And Flora doesn't even flinch. Like Flora, I think when she comes in and asks for access to Joni's room is kind of going out of her way to show her hand to Joni as if to challenge her and be like, I know that you're going to let me get away with this, even though you know who I am, you know that I'm full of shit, but you're still going to allow it. And the, just there's just this look between the two of them and this coldness to Flora that feels very um, purposeful here. Like there's a part of her, I mean, she has that moment with her, uh, with her brother earlier where she tells him like, we have to hit now because my employer is on to me. And he says to her, bullshit, you just want an excuse to go fast and hard so that you have a reason to slit someone's throat, which I find really interesting that apparently she's like the much more violent of the two of them. And he is the one that's kind of like, can you fucking keep it under control, please? Like, there's no reason for you to go to these lengths. And she doesn't seem concerned about that at all. In fact, when he tells her to calm down about it, she gives him a look like she's disgusted with him. Um, Yeah, so when Joni, like, finds her and she tells her, I'll let you go if you don't steal my shit. And I will not raise the alarm and tell anybody that you're in here and her response is just to pull a knife on Joni and be like well screw you maybe I'll cut your throat anyway and Joni's response is then you will die here like what are you doing and it's really like rewatch because I rewatched this this morning It's really sad because when she says it, it sounds like just a threat. But considering what happens later, Joni has seen this sort of shit before. That's what's so sad is that you can tell on her face that like she just doesn't want to fucking have to watch this go down the way that she knows it's going to have to go down. And Sai looks up and sees Flora leaving the room and does that little nose touch And the bartender does one and Eddie does one. And the guy at the door sort of like gets in her way. 
and positions himself so that she couldn't leave as Sai cuts in front of her and he challenges her and tries to make it as like low key as possible so that he doesn't alarm everybody else in the room because it's not good for business, right? She tells Sai, step aside and let me do my business, which I just can't handle the fucking fact that she says that to him. Like she has some brass fucking balls and he hits her and she goes down and she drops her bonnet that is fucking full of all of this jewelry and shit and then draws her knife and stabs him in the leg and tries to flee up the stairs because I guess she's going to like climb out a window. It's just like, or no, there's that. Yeah. There's the balcony. So they're going to try and climb out the balcony because uh, her brother is just waiting for her. He's acting like he's, um, you know, hooking up with one of the hookers upstairs, but he's just waiting really so that he can run off with her. And the two of them like drop down the pole uh, from the balcony and are getting to their horses. And it really does look like they're going to be able to get away for a second. But the security guy knows which horses are theirs and is waiting right there for them. And these fucking kids, and I call them kids, even though they're adults, but they're so like small and young looking, they get walloped. Like it is a brutal scene. He, especially her, like they're going after her just to subdue her, but the boy, they are absolutely like crushing and it's really gross. There's a point when the um, dude who's like the security, like the bouncer basically for Bella Union looks up at Sai with this delighted expression on his face because he obviously really enjoys hurting him and he will, is the one who ends up sort of dragging um, Flora inside and he drags her by the head. Like if you watch that scene, I don't know how they did this exactly, but it looks like he just has her in a headlock and that's all he's using to support her whole body as he drags her to the door. And I mean, she probably weighs like a hundred pounds, so it's probably not that difficult to do, but I don't know that that's actually her. It might be a, Maybe a stunt person or it could be a fucking prop, you know. Um, but everybody on the street is a little bit horrified at how violent this just got because it goes just so far. You know, they 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 really beat on Miles so badly that they almost kill him right out there in the street as it is. And Sai brings the two of them inside into his private room and makes Joni come up. And be there as he like tortures them. And it's this awful moment when Eddie comes and tells Joni, Sai wants to see you. Like you can tell that Eddie doesn't want to fucking call her up either. Like Eddie feels, I think, in a lot of ways, the same way that Joni does. And I had been talking last episode about how I didn't really understand what the deal was with Eddie and how confrontational or not even just confrontational just snide he was with Sai because I had assumed that they were on the same side and that I was also puzzled by how upset Joni seemed to be at watching Sai treat uh, Andy this way because I was taking her being upset as more than just being upset but at being disgusted and surprised at at realizing who Psy really is. And now I see that I was misreading that entirely. I was misreading her in that I was assigning this expression on her face that she was having to it being a revelation. And that's not it. It's not a revelation. It's just her seeing this shit again. It's her more than anything. It's being confirmed to her for probably the hundredth time, what a piece of shit Sai is and how much of a bummer it is. It's just a reminder. And I'm realizing with Eddie that I think it might be along the same lines. Like he's as snide as he is with Sai because he doesn't like the guy and he is expressing his, I don't want to say insubordination, but at least his disapproval in the only way that he can 
without straight up getting in trouble or hurt or whatever. But what it comes down to, I think, is both she and Eddie don't like Sai, don't like working for him. And if they had the option to walk away, they would do it, but they simply don't. And Eddie probably has more of an option than she does, but I can't help but think that there's like, I feel like for Eddie, there might be some sense of obligation that like, you know, he is the uh, tiny bit of, I was going to say conscience, but that doesn't seem fair. Because it doesn't, I don't get the impression that Eddie ever says anything that changes Sai's mind entirely on anything. But maybe he just feels like it wouldn't be fair for him to save himself when somebody like Joni is stuck there. And maybe I'm giving him too much credit. Maybe he's just not leaving because as much as he knows Sai is a piece of shit, maybe he doesn't really have that much of a problem with him. Um, but I get this, like this moment is just the look that he has when he summons her and the look that she has when she goes, it's just neither of them want to be here for this at all. So Sai is sitting across from the two of them and they're tied to chairs and he is banging on her head with his fist. Like it's really brutal. Um, and Joni is like almost hyperventilating watching this because obviously this is bringing up some bad shit for her personally. And this is obviously just a terrible thing to watch. I haven't gone through anything like this and watching this and I know it's not even real is really fucking difficult. So Joni, you know, she's got some obvious trauma in her past as well as the horror of this on its own. Um, so first of all, Sai just has to like push it. And he does this for Joni's benefit as well as Eddie's benefit. He says later um, that I have to let people know that this is what I'm willing to do that. I don't like it and I don't want it, but this is what I am willing to do. He punches miles in the face and then shoots him and he shoots him like really pretty quickly. Like, that one's over fairly soon. But then he makes Joni be the one to kill Flora. Um, and he's like essentially doing this because he wants Joni to be a party to it. He wants to involve her. He wants her to be guilty so that she can't distance herself entirely and be like, you did this to these, these poor kids. And he frames it as you are having mercy on her because if you don't shoot her, I'm going to make it last a lot longer. So it's a too tempting a way to put it because I think Joni knows what he's capable of. And the way that she looks at Flora before she shoots her, she looks like she wants to cry and she cocks the gun again. Like she's going to try and kill herself. And Sai grabs the gun away from her and says, oh, no, you don't. You keep drawing breath right here. And she looks like she might throw up. It's like a really intense moment. Um, but. Oh, uh, guys. Yeah. So the conversation that he has with her later um, don't think I enjoyed that bullshit, but certain things you have to impress upon people that you are willing to do, which like he's saying that, but I don't think that she needed that impressed upon her, nor did Eddie. They didn't have an audience of everyone at the gym. I feel like, or everyone at the Bella Union. I feel like if they had, honestly, as gross as that would be it would really make a lot more sense to me. But instead, he's doing this for the benefit of Joni and Eddie, who I think understand exactly who Sai is already. He did not need to do this. You know? And and he's just trying to, I don't know. He's trying to justify it. Um, and he comes out there and says, and I'm telling you, your happiness is important to me, and whatever the fuck I gotta do, 
if you're too much in my shadow, if I make things too tough on you, then we're going to stop it. We're going to do something else. And she is trying so hard to keep it together. Like she, like I said, she looks like she kind of wants to throw up. She's on the edge of crying, but she never quite lets herself cry. And then says, well, what if I let you set up your own business here? I'll put up the money. Um, you can be an independent operator and find, you know, any place that's your place. I want you to feel when I walk in there that you can say, I'm busy, Cy. Come back later. And I want you to watch me turn around like I'm some rube trick and say, well, when should I try you again, Joni? And you can say, I'll let you know, Cy. And I was like, <sighs> Honestly, low key, wanting her to take this deal, even though I know it's not real. Like, and I, when I say not real, what I mean is he's offering her the illusion of independence. He's not really letting her go. He's going to be the one funding it. And when it comes right down to it, if she does something he doesn't like, he can take it all away. And everyone knows it. You know, if he's the one who puts up money, and he's the one that owns like the biggest business in town other than Al. People are going to cave to whatever he wants. She's not going to matter. And she's not stupid. She knows that. So I feel like the Joni of like, you know, maybe 10 years ago might have gone for this deal and thought that it was true and could be, you know, something that worked. But this Joni, she's seen too much now and knows that it won't. Um. And she tells him, kill me to sigh or let me go. And he looks so angry when she says that. Um, like he just can't believe the insult that she's dealing him. But she says, you've got to figure out a way to mean it. Because if you don't kill me or let me go, I am going to find a way to kill you. And he just walks away. I want to know their history so bad. I really do. Because he like does seem, he does like care about her in his twisted, awful way. But I don't understand what the fuck. History, like what's between them. You know, I just want to know more about what's what they've been through together. Where he found her, what's going on. It's just like, ugh. And she's standing there watching at that moment as Trixie makes her way back to the gym. And it's like, she doesn't know what happened with Trixie, right? I would assume. Almost nobody does. Um, but there's a look on her face as she watches Trixie walk by where you really get the impression that maybe she doesn't know exactly what happened, but she knows exactly what's happening. Like, and I'm going to back it up here now and talk about Trixie. So the doctor, uh, he is very, very busy lately. Um, a crew of guys who went out to get the vaccine managed to get back. So he has set up a, um, a spot where they are all, queuing up to get their inoculations. So he's been a little bit distracted. And after her fight with the widow, Trixie goes to his place and finds some dope and tries to kill herself and apparently punctures her vein, which is the only reason that she manages to survive because it doesn't all get into her system the way that it's supposed to. So the doctor has been performing inoculations all morning and somebody comes around asking him if he knows where Trixie is. He sees the widow and inquires of her if she knows. And she says, I assumed that she went back to the gym last night. And he's just sort of like low key, like that's weird. I wonder where she is. Well, then he goes back to his office. He finds her passed out on the fucking floor. And he's like, oh, fuck. And I appreciated so much that he's keeping her hidden because he knows precisely what Al Swearingen is and what could happen to her if Al finds out that she tried to kill herself. Like the punishment for that. I'm, it's essentially the same as Joni, you know, she is a commodity. 
And he can't have a commodity running off and, and taking herself out of the equation. That is not an option. So he keeps her hidden, even though Merrick, the newspaper guy, tries to like bust in at one point and is like all worried that he's getting the fucking smallpox. And it turns out that he's just put on a lot of weight and it's putting some strain on his back. And he's had back pain like for ages, but it's suddenly gotten really bad. And the doctor's like, well, have you gained a bunch of weight suddenly very recently? To which she's like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Which I find like very funny because there's some stuff that I get really irritated when plenty of ailments are attributed to somebody's weight because like fat phobia is a very real thing, guys. You can read about how many women have come to doctors asking for help on something very specific. And they were told that whatever it was, was only due to them being too fat. And then they come to find out later that they have like stage three ovarian cancer or whatever. And there are million stories out there like this. So on the one hand, I was like, oh no, he's just going to tell him he's too fat. But on the other hand, as somebody who lives in a fat body, I can tell you that putting on weight suddenly does put a strain on parts of your body that you're just like, what the fuck? And it's 100% because of weight. Um, and Merrick is carrying considerably more than even I am. So I would imagine it does weigh on him, pun intended. So the doctor is keeping her hidden and he gives her... Um, some some hope by asking her if she would be willing to go with the widow to New York. Now, I had said last episode that I was confused about why she got as angry as she did at the widow when the widow suggested, I um, keep calling her the widow, but Alma suggested that she go on without her with the child to New York because the only thing that I really felt was insulting was, I don't want to change up my life, but why don't you change up all of yours? Which is certainly plenty. But when Alma tells the doctor later, I, I made her this offer that you're talking about. And she said, no. And the doctor seems like confused. Then she clarifies, well, I offered to send her on to New York to meet with my relatives and get settled. And he says, is it possible that she considers going with you and the child and being of service a more compelling proposition than a uh than being sent on some cruel masquerade and then i realized what it is she was disgusted that the widow was basically trying to get rid of her and the child so that she didn't have to worry about them anymore by pushing them off on on this errand that would absolutely not work out that it was just a, I'm going to pretend I'm doing you a favor when really I want you out from underfoot. And I know that this favor that I'm doing you is almost definitely not going to work out. I just want you gone. Because I didn't really think through what she was saying. I What I thought when she said, I'm going to send you on and have you get settled was I'm going to send you first and have you be settled as like for when I get home and you can be like my lady's maid once I get back myself. But I'm realizing now I kind of misunderstood what she was saying. She isn't intending to follow them at any point in the near future. And the the way that she was planning on doing this was like, what, I'm going to write to my relatives and tell them to take you in? As what? A servant? When, like, and you're somebody that they don't know, that they've never met, with a child that they don't know, that they've never met, that is not even my child. And they're supposed to simply, like, give, like, make you the nanny. Like, how would this even work? And, yeah, the like, once I put it in those terms, I'm like, yeah, this is, like, an, a non-starter. She'd get there, and they might, like, be polite to her, but in the end, probably would keep her at arm's length while they wrote back and forth to Alma, like, what are you doing? We don't want them here. This little girl isn't yours. We don't know this woman. So unless Alma takes direct custody of this little girl herself and decides that, like, I'm going to treat her like she is my daughter, there's no reason for them to give her the time of day. And 
I just don't, I didn't really like understand what she was asking of Trixie, I guess is, is my point. So when the doctor says, do you think she'd appreciate that more than some cruel masquerade? She looks pretty ashamed of herself. And then it's like, listen, tell her I would be happy to have her. If she's well enough, I would be happy to go and tell her myself that she's very welcome to come with me and that I would like that. And he seems relieved. And I like the fact that in the scene before, when she goes to get um, Sophie, Sophia, as we find out her name is inoculated, she tells him like, thank you very much for everything. And she has this expression on her face. Like it's, it's a, uh, a real apology that she's kind of making as she thanks him. And I said before that I want them to like be buds because they're both really smart people. And I liked the fact that he could tell how smart she is. And this bodes well to me that they're on the same side now, or at least a little bit more allied than they were before, because I want the smart people to team up on this show, you know, and there's really precious few people on this show who aren't smart. They're just smart in very different ways from each other. Al is that smart where he like is an opportunist opportunist and he can see, um, he can focus on long-term stuff rather than short-term stuff. And, can understand the moves that people are trying to make, although he overestimates sometimes and that results in him being quite paranoid. I mean, you know, we have uh Seth who really isn't in this episode all that much. Um, and he is smart about like seeing through to people's actual intentions, which, you know, implies some cynicism, which I definitely think is true, but, he manages to see it without necessarily letting it like infect the way that he thinks about things. Um, and you know, Joni's knowing exactly what the hell is going on with this girl, I think. Um, and you know, I started off this episode saying that like, I don't really understand the point of this storyline, but now I feel like I, like after talking it over, I feel better about it. And I think I do. It's just like, I think I just wanted it to go on for longer. I think I wanted, even though obviously Flora is like a sociopathic. I mean, when Sai has her knife in front of her and is waving, she's like obviously fucked up from being hit and can't see like one of her eyes might've been dislocated. Cause you know, that can happen um, or just being hit on the head, like a severe concussion so that she's seeing double. She's so, so in such bad shape and still trying to get the knife from him. Like she is determined to try and like take this guy out somehow. So, and she's like clearly like a bad person, but I still kind of wanted her to like win just because I want her to beat Sai because Sai is so terrible. Um, so I think I just wanted that storyline to mean more for Flora specifically and not to be something that leads to our understanding of a character that existed before Flora showed up, if that makes sense. Um, she, her storyline is really meant to reveal Joni to us. And I want her storyline to mean something for her on its own. And other than knowing that she's like a little bit crazy and can read people pretty well. Other than that, yeah, not not that much. So, but you know, we can't always get what we want. Um, but yeah, so back to Trixie. Um, when the the widow goes to her and offers for her to come, um, well, she's intending to offer her to come, but then she has a uh, talk with Seth and decides that she's going to stay because, as it turns out. Seth goes out onto the claim with um with Doherty and uh what's his face and finds out that there is a ton of gold on the claim so she shouldn't sell and she plans to stay and like oversee the uh I would say like the I would I want to say the mining of it because it's not panning it's in rock it's a vein um but she goes and tells, ah, uh, I just felt so bad. She goes and tells Trixie, I'm planning on staying, but I'd really like it if you would continue to stay with us. And if you do want to leave and she gives her a chunk of this gold, 
and is like, if you do want to leave, I want you to take this and use this to start a new life somewhere else. Oh, guys, I'm so sad about this. So Trixie asks for some time to think it over. And in this scene also, um, there, this is the moment when Sophia tells her her own name. And it's a really emotional moment because you see a, like this moment earlier where Alma is trying to explain to the little girl, I'm going downstairs to talk to Mr. Bullock. And she doesn't know how to deal with this girl. She has no understanding of how to like communicate well or be motherly or anything. It's just so awkward to watch. And then how completely natural Trixie is with this little girl. And the little girl says Trixie's name, but she doesn't say Alma's name. I'm not sure she knows Alma's name. And talks to her and tells her her own name, but doesn't tell Alma. Alma is just not a factor to this little girl, but Trixie is no future for this little girl. You know, it's just such a terrible situation. Um, but she, like, Trixie's like, like, give me a day to, like, think it over. And we see her, like I said, walking past Joni after getting well enough that she's able to walk and she brings the gold that Alma gave her to Al and goes upstairs and gets into bed with him. And it's getting emotional. Hello. It's brutal guys, because those of you who are not familiar with re like abusive relationships don't will we'll watch this and be like, how the fuck she had every chance to get away. She had more than one option and she's not taking any of them. Why? And I don't know how many of you heard about this news story a little while back of this young girl who was trafficked and she was purchased by a man who raped her constantly. And she wound up finally shooting the man and stealing a bunch of his money. And instead of fleeing, she returned to her pimp who had sold her in the first place. And a lot of people were calling bullshit on her story because of that, because she didn't just run away because she went back to the man who trafficked her. And she was a minor when this began. And ignorant people will say, if she had really been desperate to get away from this guy who had bought her, she would have just taken his money and run and started a new life somewhere else. If you are a woman who has been abused and violated and treated as if she is a thing and that that is where her worth lies, and that you are the one person who will ever keep her safe, even if you don't. If you manage to convince her of that, it is a very difficult thing for someone to walk away from. And I have seen this kind of relationship and seen women get the opportunity to leave and not take it. And people are baffled. But she, in her heart, and I'm talking about Trixie now, does not believe there is anything else for her. And that's what it comes down to in this person's life when someone has, has essentially sort of brainwashed them they believe this is all I deserve. This is all there is. 
and I'm going to try and make the best of it with them by making them happy, by bringing them something to make up for my fuck up. Because that's how they see it, of course. They were bad and they need to make restitution for that. So this scene where Trixie goes back to Al is so heartbreakingly accurate and painful to watch. And I'm hoping that eventually she will figure out a way to get away. But like women who leave abusers oftentimes have to make several tries And if they manage to leave, often wind up dead later. You know, it's, it's, I'm concerned because I want Trixie to leave, but I also want Trixie alive. And I can't help but think that if she ever does manage to walk away, he'll find her. You know, I don't think Al ever lets her leave on purpose. I don't think he ever sets her free. And her situation and Joni's are are in some ways very different because of the way that they have have sort of created this illusion of a power structure. Trixie is very clearly Al's subordinate in in the gym like she's always walking around in the same clothing as all of the other whores like it just in her bloomers and a top she is always um in one of the rooms she's not hanging around downstairs with him and the way that they have things set up at bella union is that Joni is dressed up as a lady and appears to be like size right hand in a lot of ways But she is in the same situation as Trixie. It's just window dressing. It's just made to appear more palatable. And that's the point of him making the offer that he does to Joni to have her own place. It's she'd be in the same situation. It would just look nicer. It would just look, you know, it would just be easier to swallow. And the way that Joni looks at Trixie as she walks by, she knows this is a woman going back to the guy who's, who's abusing her. She can see it. You know, this is the fucking walk that she has probably taken many times. Um, so yeah, it is just fucking awful. And, you know, Alma sees her heading back to the gym out the window and goes over to Sophia and begins to like sing to her to kind of comfort herself because she knows what that means. And the guilt that she has over the way that she presented things to begin with, I think is pretty, is weighing pretty heavily on her. I think she really thought that she was going to be able to uh, pull the wool over Trixie's eyes because she thinks Trixie is a simple fool and Trixie is not still alive after going through everything that she has gone through because she's stupid and she kind of betrayed Trixie by treating her that way and if she hadn't handled it in that manner might have been able to convince her that there was something else that was possible and she sort of ruined it I think, I, I think that's how that worked out. Um, anyway, so, um, I'm going to talk really quickly about what happened with Alma and Seth as well, because Seth goes on the, uh, on the exploration of the, um, of the claim quite against Alma's will. Like she's about to just sell. She wants to just give it up and get out of there and, uh, and, tries to tell Seth that like, I know that you made a promise that you were going to do this for me, but I'm releasing you from that promise. I really don't want anything more to do with this. And he tells her basically like, I respect that you don't want me to do this, but I didn't make the promise to you. I made the promise to wild bill who is now dead. So I can't take it back and I'm going to do it. 
and turns out to be a good thing he does because and it's so painful too on in a way because eb at the beginning of the episode is trying desperately to convince al and doherty that they should just go and kill seth and kill the widow dispose of their bodies and then forge a bill of sale from weeks ago that they can then use to claim that it's theirs and you know, this was the thing that I had presented last episode of just being like, I don't know what options there are now for killing her. I feel like would be a really bad idea. So trust EB to be like, yeah, that really bad idea is the thing we should totally do. Um, but what happens is that the men who come back with the, uh, the inoculation, the, the vaccine tell Al that there has been a treaty signed and that the Sioux are going to be taken off of this land. And that the, like, the camp is going to be probably heading in the direction of being a real legit town. And Al decides that as much as he would love to have all of the gold on the widow's claim, in the long term, it's much smarter for him to leave Seth alive and use Seth as, like, the front man, the basically face of the town. Because he presents a really respectable and welcoming and lawful sort of presence that will make people want to settle here. And he decides to just like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the claim alone in favor of Seth being essentially like he, I think kind of wants Seth to be the mayor a little bit. And then uh, he will be raking in money for a much longer period because of this place booming into a full fledged town rather than, you know, zeroing in on a gold claim that will eventually dry up, you know, uh, an EB seems to see the sense of this, but is just so bummed. And it is sad, like in a way, as much as I hate EB and I don't want him to have the money, it's, you know, you watch the widow almost sell. She comes so close. And the only reason that she doesn't is because Seth is like, no, I'm definitely going to check this out for you. Like I promised him and I'm going to give you my honest recommendation about what you should do. So when he comes back and talks to her and he tells her that, uh, that she shouldn't sell, she's still talking about like, well, I don't know that the, the way the claim turned out. I don't know that it should have any effect on my plans to leave for New York. And Seth says, I don't see why either, but I also don't really understand your reasons for going to New York. And she's very cagey and coy with him about it. And it's like, well, I just, you know, had it made plain to me that my reasons for staying here were rather selfish. And he doesn't press her on that, but he asks her, well, what's to prevent you from like taking care of the child here? And she looks at him in this way and I think takes it in this way that implies Seth is interested in her. And I'm not sure if that's true or not because Seth, we've talked about this already. Seth is married and has a child, at least one child, I think. So I don't know if Seth is flirting with her, if he knows the impression that he's giving her or not, or if he's blissfully unaware of the attraction that she has for him but i I, like the chemistry between them is obvious i mean listen he is just so pretty it's just so annoying um i just can't i i can't decide what he's doing in other words like i feel like what he said he was encouraging her to stay and i think he was doing that because he wants her around but you're married, dude. What in the, like your whole thing was supposed to be, you're setting up this, uh, this hardware store so that you can create a stable business for your family to come and join you at some point. So what exactly are you doing here, buddy? Cause your wife and child are coming to meet you. And then what, you know, like, and, and it's not like, you know, she's not a, um, Alma when I say she, Alma is not in a position to be a man's mistress. I mean, let's, I I don't think Seth would take a mistress to begin with, but let's say that he were going to Alma is much too high born and well off to be anybody's mistress. That would not happen. So what, what's he doing? What's he doing? 
unless he's not married, unless he's just saying he's married. Um, which, why would he do that? I don't know, you know? Um, but anyway, so, so yeah, that's what's going on with the, the, uh, two of them. And by that's what's going on. I mean, I don't know what's going on. She's obviously into him. I get the impression that he's into her, but I don't know what he like long-term expects to happen here. And meanwhile, poor Saul is still into Trixie and doesn't know what's going on with her. And I just want Saul to like whisk her away and save her. And I know that's not going to happen and it shouldn't happen, but I want somebody to save Trixie period, you know? Um, yeah, that whole, and like when, when Alma comes downstairs and tells, uh, EB that it's a bonanza. I didn't know that that was like the word that they used for that, for, for, you know, striking it rich with gold, but hearing her say it's a bonanza was so funny. Um, so yeah, I feel like those are the main issues going on in this episode. Um, oh, Patrick's saying in the comments, uh, FYI, the Flora storyline was supposed to be longer, but there was some behind the scenes actor agent BS going on. So it got cut short. Oh, okay. Cause I was really surprised by that. So that makes sense because it, it just had the feel like they were really laying groundwork for something to go on for a while. So, okay. Um, Chris is, oh, she's talking about the, uh, news story that I had been mentioning earlier. Yeah. And she was a child. Oh, and then I love you, Natasha. I love you too, Krista. Um, so yeah, this show is really good, but like really painful at times too. Um, mm, yeah. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to wrap this up, but I really hope that this episode is a, like the next one that I cover is a little bit more like action packed and upbeat because this one was too emotional and I couldn't handle it. And I'm sad now. So, uh, you guys want to join me in the next, uh, in about 10 minutes from now, I will be covering the next Veronica Mars episode. So, um, yeah, come and hang out with me while I do that. It's a uh, season two, episode three, cheaty, cheaty, bang, bang, which is hysterical. I hate that name so much. So come and talk to me then. And, um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Patrick, for commissioning this. And I'll see you soon with a new episode. Spoiled Network Podcast.